We're going to continue our study on the Word. Remember, Jesus is the Word. And if it's God's Word, it's Jesus. Jesus and the Word are one. And we're going to continue looking at the purpose and power of words. The purpose and power. And of course, none of this is going to work for us if we don't humble ourselves and do what God says to do. It might not seem realistic to us. It doesn't, 99.9% .9 of the time, it doesn't make sense in the natural to do it God's way. But regardless, we do it simply because we know that God loves us and wants the best for us. Amen? So we will humble ourselves under the word of God, do what he asks us to do. We've been made... Speaking spirits like God. And the word is not there for us to read and walk away from because we saw then we're like a natural man that looks in the mirror and we read the word, walk away. There isn't a lot of places where God has said, read my word, read my word, read my word. And yet a lot of times that's sort of what we do. And I can tell in my own life when I've done nothing but read the word, I can tell by my behavior whether I've done what God's told me to do or I've just read the word. We also looked at the fact that every word is a seed, that we can condemn every tongue that rises against us, that our our ways in the natural are not God's ways and it's time we find out what God's ways are and we saw what God's ways are. It says the rain comes down and it goes up. Isaiah 55. So this morning, we closed yes, last time with James 1, 24 to 26. We're going to look at that. James 1, 24 to 26. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. That's what happens when you do nothing but just read the word. Next verse. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, in order to be a hearer, what must happen? Words must be spoken. If you don't hear spoken words, you're not a hearer because there's nothing to hear. And they say the words that you hear yourself speak, you believe more than the words somebody else speaks. But you do what it says to do. Then you will be blessed. You can read the word every minute of every day. If you don't do what it says, you're deceived. And you will not walk in the blessing. You're blessed as far as the word goes. But you're not experiencing what God has given to you. Next verse. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not what? He deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. You can see why David said, set a watch over my mouth, Lord, that I sin not against your law or against your word. Every time you speak something contrary to the word of God, your tongue wasn't bridled, and you've spoken contrary to what God says. And it's a reproach to God because you read and study the children of Israel when they start speaking against God, murmuring, he said it was a reproach. So every time you speak against the word of God, say something opposite. It's a reproach to God. Then your religion is useless. Now we can see why we hate religion. Amen? So now, the purpose of words and the power of words... Words frame your life. 
Words frame your health and words frame your prosperity. And so now we are going to be a doer of the word, right? And so let's look at what God's telling Joshua. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verses 8, verse 8 to Joshua 1 8. What's the first thing God told him be strong and courageous? What does he have to be strong and courageous about? The first part. God said, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You must speak my word. And we all know there's situations, well, maybe not you all, but I know there's been times when I've been in a situation and you're ready to speak the word and you kind of, you know, you're not bold, you're not strong, you're not courageous in speaking it. Joshua had to be strong and bold to speak because he went through all those murmurers. So the first thing we're to do is speak the word of God. So, then we meditate in it day and night. But we speak and meditate on what we've been speaking. You can read it, but if you don't speak it and meditate, it won't change your way of thinking. We are told in Romans chapter 12 to change the way we think so we don't think the way the world thinks. We are to think the way God thinks and that's not the way the world thinks. So there is a priority according to God to speak. Well, it's so obvious when you look in the first chapter of Genesis, how did God create? Faith, but what did he do? Faith speaks. Paul said, we having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. God believed, and he spoke. Light, etc., he created by speaking. Your words create the atmosphere you're living in. Amen. Kenneth Copeland, a number of years ago, had a teaching. You're the prophet of your life. Your words create your atmosphere. And don't let words of somebody else create your atmosphere. Your words Create your atmosphere. So don't let this law, this book, the word, out of your mouth so you get the word. And of course you have to read the word to get the word to know what to speak. But there's the speaking. It is vitally important to follow God's instructions because we're to be a doer of the word and the word says to speak the word. You see, the word, God's word, connects us to God's life. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, my word is spirit and life. If you don't speak the word of God, get the word of God, you're not connecting to God's life. You may have been born again, spirit-filled, and all of that is in your spirit spirit man, but to get it out and connect to it, we have got to speak it, meditate on it, or you're not going to connect to it. And God set this whole thing up with words. The purpose of words is the fact that they are creative. God made that decision. Doesn't matter if we like it or not, God made the decision that words are creative or destructive. It was words that caused Adam and Eve to fall. They didn't even have a thought of that tree or to eat it. They didn't even have the thought 
of God holding back from them. It wasn't in their thinking until somebody, the snake, Satan, spoke words to them and they entertained those words. You entertain the words you speak. You have got to speak the word or the words other people speak of the world that is not God's ways. You will take them in, entertain them, and it will change you. Now, of course, we know we're not talking about our spirit man here. We're talking about our heart, our soul realm. People have said, I don't know why I ever did that. Simple. You thought about it. That thought came and you listened to it until you did it. Now we can see why God puts such a high priority on words, but he, is, he won't force us to speak his word. He tells us what we should do to walk in victory, but he never forces us. We even have to willingly go along with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he gives us the words, but we must open our mouth and allow ourselves to speak the utterance, the tongues that the Holy Spirit gives us. He doesn't force us. And this is why sometimes people have a problem getting filled with Holy Spirit because they just sort of open their mouth and expect Holy Spirit to move their tongue and do all of these things. But he's not going to do that. You start speaking the first thing that comes to you and he will fill your mouth. Amen. So it's the mouth that connects us to it. Let's go to um, Joshua. Did we finish with Joshua? 1.8, let's read that again, please. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. That means we know any time a contrary thought comes, we are to counter it with the word of God. That way we will observe to do all that is written in it. Well, as I speak, for instance, that the name is the authority of Jesus and he's given me that authority and every time I speak the name of Jesus, demons tremble. That's being obedient to the word. Where the, what the word is that we're talking about here that we're obedient to is speaking. Not letting the word depart from our mouth, meaning we're not going to speak a whole bunch of other stuff. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. If you speak the word of God and meditate the word of God, thinking about what God said speaking, but then you speak what you speak, you meditate on, you will be prosperous and you will have good success. And it's not because I did it one time and I waited five minutes and it didn't work. It becomes a lifestyle. You absolutely must be committed to the fact that God's word is true. And I don't care how long I have to stand doing it. It will come to pass because he said, then my way will be prosperous. Amen. And then I will have good success. Amen. End of story. Amen. He said it. And that settles it. it. You can argue with him if you want. But he's not going to change his mind. Then he says, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. We have Holy Spirit inside us. He goes with me everywhere I go. I'm never alone. Ever. So if I want to be prosperous and have good success, I must speak the word of God in every situation. And one is, I have sufficient for every good work, and I require no outside aid or help because my seed that I have sown is multiplied back to me in Jesus' name. I speak that whether I see it or not. I'm saying what God's word has said, and I'm going to be a doer of the word. It's just that simple. Is it easy? Well, it's not always easy in the the midst of whatever but we speak that no matter what our body tells us or how it feels we speak that like the centurion said speak the word 
only, and my servant shall be healed. I speak the word of God, and my way is prosperous, and I have good success. And that means financially, it means soundness of mind, and it means in my body, my healing, my total life. I've been redeemed spirit, soul, and body. So it covers every area of my life to be prosperous and have good success. Because the word of God's in my mouth. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. So let's look at Deuteronomy. Another verse here, Deuteronomy. But the word is very near you. And where is the word of God supposed to be? Second reference. In your mouth. The word of God is in your mouth. You're to speak the word of God. Joshua was told, don't let it depart. Don't be speaking contrary to the word. And now the word is very near you in your mouth. When it's in your mouth, it'll get into your heart. It'll change the way you think. So that you may obey it. So that you may obey it. Yes, we're to obey the word of God. Does that have a bearing on whether I get born again or not? Yes. Because if you don't do what it says to get born again... You won't be. It, that teaching that everybody is going to get saved is wrong. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. And if you don't bow your knee to Jesus, confess him as Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, you will not be saved. Everybody is not going to heaven. If Jesus is rejected, you're not going to go to heaven. You will go to hell. Hell is a real place. It's just that simple. Listen closely. I have set before you today life and prosperity, good and death, and adversity and evil. Now, if you flip back up to that previous verse, it's talking about mouth, right? The word is very near you in your mouth, and we'll, that you may obey it. Next, it's in your mouth. The word's in your mouth, verse 15. Listen closely. The word's in your mouth. I've set before you today life and prosperity, good and death and adversity, evil. How is this going to come, this good that God set before us, going to come to pass? The purpose and power of words were to speak. He said to speak the word of God. When you speak the good word of God, you will have life and prosperity. Isn't that exactly what God told Joshua? I'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. That's what he's commanding us to do. And a lot of people try and keep all these other commands, but they don't do the one he's telling us to do, and he's telling us to speak the word. Speak the word. This is what he's telling us. Not all these other things. Speak the word. So our mouth has a priority over our mind. Our mouth is to speak the word of God regardless of what our mind wants to do. And when you speak God's words, God's words are truth, their spirit, their life. And now you are speaking into the spirit realm, the creative realm, what created everything. And you're speaking life. You speak something opposite than God's word, you are speaking death. If you're speaking sickness and disease, you're speaking death. If you're speaking poverty and lack, you're speaking death. Now, I, I don't know about any, I have not lived with only one other person that's believed God, and all the rest were murmuring and wanting to go back to slavery, like for 40 years, Joshua did. And he had to take these people into the promised land in place of Moses, and God says, 
You've got to be strong and courageous to speak my word. And today, we want good success and we want prosperity and health and healing. We speak the word only. We obey the instructions of God. Purpose and power. See, we're created in God's image. So what we speak comes to pass in our life, either for good or evil. And you choose life by choosing God's word. We choose life. Now, we may have had a past. We may have had whatever happening. But we don't look at that. And we may have, up until today, spoken words opposite of God's word. But we start today speaking God's word. Starting right now, we speak what God says. I have sufficient for every good work. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. You've got to realize healing is spiritual, not physical. And as long as we look at our physical body as to whether we're healed or not, we won't get healed. We must look at it in the, in the, in the spirit realm because when Adam fell, that's when the body started to die. It was a spiritual thing taking on the nature of Satan and rejecting the nature of God. Well, now we have the nature of God and we've got the healing power inside us, but we have to attack sickness and disease in the spirit realm. So when I speak by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed, and now my mouth is doing what it's supposed to, I am not speaking to this per se, but the spirit behind what caused this problem. You see, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Arthritis, migraine headaches, cancer, whatever problem it is, there is a spirit behind it. It came when Adam fell, and you speak to that thing that it must desist in its maneuvers and die. Amen. In the authority of Jesus, because Jesus defeated you. And I don't look at my body to see if I'm healed. I don't look at my bank account to see if I'm prosperous. I look into the perfect law of liberty and I speak what the perfect law of liberty has said to me. I obey God and speak his word. Amen? Let's take a New Testament scripture, Romans 10, please. Romans 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. Now, I didn't bring these up in Deuteronomy, but these verses are also in Deuteronomy. Romans 10, 6. But the righteousness of faith does what? We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because we're the righteousness of God, we speak. We are speaking spirits like God. And this is how we speak. We don't say in our heart, who will ascend into heaven? That's like, oh, God, Jesus. You know, there was this song way back when, when we first came in, about Jesus and, and he's passing by or something. Don't pass me. Jesus isn't down here passing people by. He's on the inside of you. He's done it. He's not going to come back. It says, don't say, who will ascend into heaven? That's to bring Christ down from above. He has risen. Amen. He is risen. And he's not coming back until the rap. Well, he's not even coming back here. We'll meet him in the sky at the rapture. But until the thousand-year reign, he'll come back. But he's not coming back until then because his work is finished. Everybody say, finished. finished. He left Nothing undone, he paid the price fully. Next verse. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. There are people that do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead in order to be born again. Amen. We have a God who's alive. We are the only ones that have an alive God. 
Everybody else's is dead and in the grave. Next verse. But remember, this is talking about saying, don't say against the word of God. What does it say? What does it say? Again, God's talking about words. The word is near you in your If the word's in your mouth, you're not to shut your lips and hold your hand over it to prevent yourself from speaking it. You're to speak it. And in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Every word you speak is supposed to be a word of faith. They're creative words. Next verse. That if you what? Now when you're confessing something, are you speaking? And believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. If you do not speak, you will not be saved. That's the purpose and power of words. How powerful the minute you speak and believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead and say, Jesus, your Lord. Call on him, you confess the Lord Jesus. He is Lord. You immediately get born again. If you don't confess, you can believe all day long because it even says that the devils and demons believe. But they don't confess him as Lord. Next verse. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That word is sozo, and that's for spirit, soul, and body. And if you don't confess prosperity and healing, you will not be prosperous, and you will not be healed. Because you didn't make a confession, and when you make a confession, it's words you speak. You don't believe, don't put your faith in your confession. That's dumb. Your confession is made up of the word of God and your faith is in the word of God that you speak. Amen. We having the same spirit of faith believed and therefore speak. The reason you're making that confession is because you're believing that word and you're speaking it and you're releasing faith when you do it. Amen. Amen. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Next verse. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. He's rich to you. You've called upon him. He's rich. God's rich to you. Everything he purchased, he's rich. It's yours. For whoever what? When you call on somebody, what are you doing? Speaking. 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 We're speaking spirits. What are you? We have to check ourselves. What am I speaking? I know there was a lot of, I don't know about today, but back when we first got into the walking by faith and, and stuff. They called it the blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. They almost made you feel ashamed if you were speaking the word. Yeah. Satan was out to stop the mouths. But if you don't call on the authority of Jesus, you will not be saved. You can always substitute when you see name, authority, and character. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So there's just a few scriptures. But God's command is to speak. And he hasn't changed his mind. He still wants us to speak. So the power in that speaking, is the power there, you get born again. And in your spirit, when you speak that, the power... He says he takes out that stony heart, the heart, the spirit that, that died. Adam was born again to death in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was born again to life in the pit of hell. I believed, therefore I spoke. God raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. 
And if he's our Lord, then we will do what he says. And he says, speak the word only. So now, a purpose. What, what, what's some of this power? I want us to look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and starting in verse 2. How vitally, 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 totally important it is for us to speak the word. Amen. So verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in what? Word. word. What you say, what you speak. He is a perfect man. When I can completely, it says, then he's able to bridle the whole body. If my mind and my body want to do what it shouldn't do, it's because I've stumbled in the word. I'm speaking and thinking about the wrong thing. No one does anything until they've meditated on it and speak it. The way Creflo Dollar puts it, your body will not go anywhere that your mind has not already gone. You think, oh, I don't know why I did that. Somewhere along the line, you thought about it enough to put it in action. You know, he, he's so hilarious. He goes, all of a sudden, you wake up and you look around and you go, how did I get in this bed? Who's, why are my clothes on the floor? Oh, I didn't know. He says, you did it because you thought about it. And you thought about it long enough to do it. Everything we do, we've thought about long enough to do it. So this is why God put such emphasis on the word that we're taking in and we're speaking and speaking. Because you believe the words you speak more than you believe anybody else's words. Which is why it's such a problem if we have crooked speech, twisted speech. If we make jokes with twisted speech. That's why today they're calling wicked good and good evil. Dennis Burke a long time ago taught at one of the Copeland meetings. That's where they get the wicker chair. They take willow and they twist it and make it wicked. And he says, God abhors wicked speech. And it's a reproach when we speak wickedly. It's a reproach. Saying things, that would be like saying, um, wow, it's, it's sure a lot of snow fell at least three feet and there's just a little skiffle. Well, snow fell. But you lied when you said it was three feet. And that's not a oh, ha, ha. As believers, we have to not go into that ditch. Because you're deceiving yourself. The word of God says you're deceiving yourself. So for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Oh, glory to God, I want to be that perfect man. Amen. And I want to bridle my whole body. So this is the purpose of words, what it's going to do next verse. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Now God is comparing words, our mouth, and it's something that has to be put in our mouth like a horse. We need something in our mouth, words that come out of our mouth so we can control our whole body. Didn't we say we would be perfect? Able to control our whole body. Next verse. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. You see the rider of the horse puts a bit in, pulls the rein, makes that horse go where it wants to. The captain of a ship turns that rudder, goes wherever that sh he wants that ship to go. Next verse. Even so, the tongue. He's comparing the tongue to the bit that controls the horse and the rudder of a ship. Is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest 
a little fire kindled. Your tongue, even though it's small, can kindle a fire, a great forest of fire. You got fire in your life, destruction in your life, check your tongue. Next verse. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So we see a little kindling puts a forest on fire. The little rudder on a ship turns a big ship. The bit in the horse's mouth, no matter how big the horse, the horse will turn. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Your tongue has put you in the place you're in today, good or bad. What you have in your life today is because of your tongue. And that's because of what you've taken in. And it will defile your whole body. So that includes sickness, amen? Stress comes about through worry. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Next verse. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It is unruly full of deadly poison. So it's small, our tongue. It has great power. God gave us dominion over all the animals, amen. And so with our tongue, we take dominion and authority over animals. We can tame them because we've been given dominion over them. But no one, verse 8, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. When we get, before we get the word of God in our mouth, it is evil and full of poison. And somebody might say, well, no, before I got born again, before I knew to speak the word, I didn't curse and use those. You know what? Any word, if you say you're sick or God won't heal everybody, that is cursing. You're cursing against God in the finished work of Jesus. When we don't speak the word and we speak opposite to the word, it's evil. And it's full of deadly poison because if we speak poverty and sickness or whatever area, my marriage is just falling apart, my kids are going to hell, look at how they're behaving. You are releasing deadly poison. Remember, words are spiritual, positive or negative. So even before we knew how to speak right, if we weren't speaking God's word, we were releasing evil and poison. What are you saying to, to, to your husband, your wife, your children, your friends? What are you saying? Whatever you're saying is either evil and full of deadly poison, or it's the word of God, which brings life and changes the atmosphere around you, where you work. How are you speaking about your employer? Your employees. No one can conquer their own words on their own. You just can't make that decision to change the way you speak. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the word of God. You absolutely do. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Excluding God's influence, our tongues are like a serpent's tongue that is full of poison. We kill others and ourselves with them. What kind of words, Arlene, are you speaking to other people? Are they, you know, sometimes we might think, well, it's just a cute thing or just, you know. But is it full of evil and deadly poison? 
Or is it going to lift them up and reveal Jesus to them and the love of God to them and patience and kindness? Next verse. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. It's hypocrisy come to church or wherever somebody sees us and oh we're just blessing God and then we get out and in the vehicle going home it's like did you see so and so did you see them they just whatever and we're starting to criticize and then a brother or sister of the Lord drives up and, and they go, oh, and now you're just praying. What are you doing? Oh, we're just going home. Oh, yeah, and we're just praising the Lord as we go. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we're being a hypocrite. And the biggest problem with that is it, it, it makes our, our thinking wrong because we will never know what's going to come out under pressure. And if the wrong stuff is in, the wrong stuff's going to come out. We're being a hypocrite. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And we know with, in the Bible it's generic. Men, it includes women. Brothers, it includes sisters. We're not talking just men. Maybe they have more of a problem, but I think it would be the reverse sometimes. <laughs> Negative actions and words will deny your faith. And it stops the flow of the blessing. Remember, we had that plastic wrap on the straw and you couldn't get it from your spirit up? Well, when your mouth is speaking crooked stuff, you've just put that plastic wrap over your straw and you're not getting the power out of your spirit. You cannot produce sweet and bitter at the same time. That's not the way God is. So if any of you think God's got bitterness, stop. Love doesn't create bitterness. Amen? Amen. Check yourself. Check yourself. Your words are an indicator of what's in your heart. Check yourself. Check yourself. Check your mouth. It'll tell you what's in your heart. It'll tell you if you're on the word. And if somebody comes to you complaining, find, just, just direct them to the word. Don't get into complaining and a pity party with them. They don't need that. Sometimes we get into those situations. I'm not denying that sometimes we can get into a pity situation. But don't get in it with another person. Don't jump in the sinking boat. And I know sometimes people haven't liked it when you're not... Sympathy. Have compassion on people. Jesus filled with compassion healed. Got rid of the devil. He didn't get into sympathy and say, oh, you poor darling. Yeah, you really are sick, aren't you? Yet that really was an awful thing that happened to you, didn't it? He gave them the word. He delivered them. So don't get in that sinking boat with them. Verse 12. Did we do 11? Can a fig tree, this was good. Fig tree, my brother, does any, oh, fourth. Okay, next one. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? The snow spring yields both salt water and fresh. If you have speaking twisted words, you can't bring forth the fresh water. Anyone who says they have faith in God but doesn't act accordingly is only deceiving ourselves. 
because if our words are corrupt, our hearts corrupt. And now remember, we're not talking about our spirit when we're born again. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the heart, the soul realm, your mind, will, and emotions. And if your emotions are going, and maybe you haven't even spoken it, but you're starting to feel agitated or stressed, you're meditating on the wrong thing. Change it quickly before you start speaking that thing. The words that you speak are the fruit of your heart. And those with pure hearts don't speak perverse things. Now remember, words are seeds. And a seed has the DNA in it to produce after its kind. And the words you speak will produce after its kind. What are you speaking? Again, we can check our life and know and just change it around. This isn't to get under condemnation. We've all missed it. We've all spoken things wrong. But the point is, don't stay there. You don't have to stay there. Today is the day of salvation. God's mercies are new every morning. We start speaking the word in those situations. Speaking the word. Cast down those imaginations. Get rid of those thoughts. By speaking the word of God. And that ship will turn. That horse will turn. It has to. Because God said it would. So you just make that decision. God said it. Therefore, for my life, I'm going to just simply do what God said to do. End of story. End of story. Verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. If you're wise and understanding, you will have a conversation the King James says conversation. This says good conduct. King James said good conversation. And if you cross-reference that, it's also talking about your words. And your good conduct is also speaking good. Because in that whole context of James chapter 3, it's talking about bridling your tongue and the words you speak. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So the purpose, the power of words changes your life, changes your direction, gets you born again. And the purpose of the tongue, God set it in action. It's got creative power. And the purpose is to get your life going in the way it should be so you will be prosperous and have good success all the days of your life. God has that perfect plan and purpose, Jeremiah 29. But I'm going to read that because people just stop at verse 11. But do you know there's verse 12 and 13? Does anybody know that? 11 isn't the end of the chapter. There's 12 and 13. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace. So every thought that God has towards me is of peace. So I'm going to speak those words. And not of evil. God does not have a single evil thought. Ever. He does not have an evil thought. You know, it says that he'll wipe away all tears. And so people will go there. And if they don't see a loved one saved or whatever, the tears are gone. And that might be true. But I think the tears that are going to be wiped away are God's tears and Jesus' tears. That he paid such an enormous price so that all could be saved. And when he's going to have to condemn people to hell because they rejected Jesus, I believe that's what's going to bring tears to him. Now, that's, I, I cannot give you chapter and verse for that because I'm not going to have tears when I get to heaven. I'm just going to see my Jesus. But I believe the tears is when he's going to have to look at them 
and after what Jesus suffered so they don't have to go to hell, he's having to say, down. So his tears will be wiped away after that's done. Is that, I don't know, somehow it's the heart of a father. We're his creation. So anyway, he never has an evil thought and not of evil to give you an expected end. So that's what he has. But then you, you shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. Well, and I understand prayer and, and on your knees and at your bed and however you pray. But when we're speaking the word of God, it's prayer. Prayer is communicating with our Father. So when something happens in my life, a sickness or something tries to attack me, and I start speaking the word of God and praising God that I'm the healed, that's prayer. He hears me. He knows I'm standing. He hears me. And verse 13, and you shall seek me and find when you shall search for me with all your heart. Now that heart there is your soul realm. When God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, becomes more vital to you than your daily food. When he is your number one priority. Revelation will flow. I mean, he's not hiding from us. If he was, he would have never sent Jesus. He wouldn't send people to preach the word so I, we can hear the word. So he's not hiding from us. But I have to change the way I think in order for me to hear him and follow the plan he has for my life. If I don't f hear him, if I don't meditate, seek the word and speak the word, I will never be able to be in a place to hear him because my mind will be too worldly, too full of world thoughts and my way of doing things. And that's what he's saying here. As we have him as our number one essential priority, as we have made him Lord of our life, and we pray, speaking his word, waiting on him. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, get filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to be born again. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess Jesus as Lord. Then ask Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And the first sounds, that words that come up, up, not from your head, but up. It's Jesus. He'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Pray in other tongues. You're releasing the wisdom of God, his plan and purpose for your life. And it'll keep you at peace. And when you're there, you do hear the plans and purposes he has for you. And his number one charge to us after we're born again, we can't get born again unless we obey that charge, is speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. And your mind will be renewed, and you will know what is that good and perfect and precious will of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you,